Thank you, Mitusha, for the kind introduction. And a very good morning to all the breast imaging enthusiasts out there. I really like the way Shilpa has titled the talk. Thank you, Shilpa, for uh, inviting me. The language of breast imaging. And I'm really happy to say that we as breast radiologists, you know, to kind of quote the idiom that is very famous, speak and talk the same language. And all this is made possible by the presence of a very robust reporting and imaging system in place, which is called as the BIRATS reporting system. Now, I want to just uh, kind of uh, reiterate that reporting is nothing but communicating what you are thinking in your mind to the clinician. And that is the medium is your report. So this is an example of how you will not communicate in your report because it really doesn't give you any extra or additional details. So the same thing if I, you know, a 50 year old patient who was reported as just as a lump measuring so much and so much, if we do the correct technique and report it correctly, then how do we actually go ahead and report this patient? Now this, if, when she was imaged on ultrasound, you see that this lump was a large cyst in the retroareolar region and you have certain more findings on the mammogram. So I would like to start off with a quiz asking or any of you who wants to take it, is that which biorites would you assign to this breast or to the palpable lump? So the thing is that if you have multiple lesions in the breast, you remember that those, the more uh, sinister biorites will trump your lower biorites and the final assessment category is going to be the worst biorite, which is in this case, a biorites 5. So this biorites reporting system was initially developed in 1993. So it's gone, undergone multiple, multiple revisions. And, uh, you know, so it is something that really standardizes the reports across the board. It acts as a very good communication tool with the clinicians, and it also serves as a quality assurance tool for us. So it gives you a real, you know, standard reporting format, which we can all follow in our day-to-day -day practice. And we are going to look at each and every point of this, starting with the first point, which is the indication. Now, you are supposed to mention in the report, whether this, you know, the patient who has come to you is just for a routine screening evaluation or is come to you for a diagnostic evaluation means that the patient has some breast related problem. It could be a breast lump, it could be a discharge, something of that sort. All right. Now, the first important thing that you will mention in your report is what is the breast density in that patient? Now, this is nothing but a subjective assessment of the percentage of fibroglandular tissue that is seen in the breast. So it ranges from a purely fatty appearing breast to scattered fibroglandular, which is type B, to heterogeneously dense to extremely dense. So type A, B, C, D, the importance here is because in type C and D, because of the breast density, you might miss out on small cancers. Third most important finding uh, point that you will include in your report is the descriptors. Okay, Now, you can either have a mass, asymmetry, architectural distortion, calcifications, and certain associated features. So let's just revise quickly before we come to the, uh, you know, the final conclusion or the assessment categories. So a mass is something but nothing but a three-dimensional structure, which is seen in two different projections. We have to remember that it has a convex outer border. It is denser in the center than in the periphery. And you describe it with its location. Location we all know, which breast, then which quadrant and clock phase location that it uh, exists in, you have to give the distance from the nipple and also mention whether it is, it is in the anterior middle or the posterior depth of the breast. Now, the shape of the mass, it, I remember the mnemonic ROI, so th that which is round is round, then oval and that which is not round or oval falls into the irregular category, okay? Then you describe the density. Density of the mass is described as comparison with equal amount of surrounding fibroglandular tissue. So you have a mass here which is containing fat density. It is lesser or lower in density to the surrounding fibroglandular tissue. Here you have a mass which is equal in density and here you have a mass which is higher in density as compared to the surrounding glandular tissue. Now, 
the most important you know descriptor of a mass is going to be its margin so let us spend a couple of minutes and understand the margin descriptors that are described in the pyrads now when more than three fourth of the margin is well seen and well circumscribed you are going to call this mass as a circumscribed mass now conversely if you have a margin which shows these irregular you know i call them sunburst kind of appearance then these are nothing but speculation and this becomes a speculated lesion now if you have these little lumpy you know bumps along the margins which are more than 5 in number this margin is going to be a microlobulated margin and let us understand these two margins you have a margin you have a mass where the margin is seen but in spite of being seen you do not see the dis distinctiveness or the this you know the edge of the margin or the edge of the mass very properly so this becomes an indistinct margin this is a obscure margin where you have a mass where the part of the margin is not seen because it is obscured by surrounding fibroglandular tissue now the importance is that the indistinct margin is a bad margin so you have to remember that that this is not a good margin to have so except circumscribed all these margins are suspicious margins now let's talk about the other descriptors asymmetry is nothing but you know the unilateral deposits of fibroglandular tissue that do not conform to a mass now it is usually a one view finding and occurs as a superimposition shadow or as a result of summation artifacts the other types of asymmetry are global focal and developing which are seen in more than one projections then as opposite to a mass they will have concave outer borders and they are also in also interspersed with fat areas all right now coming to the third descriptor which is the also the third most common appearance of non fibrable breast cancers and that is architectural distortion it means simply that the architecture of the breast is distorted but you do not see an associated mass in its center now this can be a primary finding or an associated finding so how does it look like it looks like radiating thin lines or speculations which are seen you can see a focal retraction of the parenchymal edge or blurring of the fat fibroglandular junction you can also see straightening or thickening of the cooper's ligaments or compression of tissue around the mass now calcifications are something that we saw in great detail in the beautiful talk given by dr rupa so i will just quickly run through them we know that there are morphologically benign and morphologically suspicious appearing calcifications what are the benign appearing calcifications we saw them skin dystrophic popcorn the calcification of plasma cell mastitis milk of calcium and punctate calcifications and you have these suspicious appearing calcification just to revise post heterogeneous fine pleomorphic and fine linear branching with fine linear branching having a positive predictive value of almost 70% again just to quickly revise you have distribution which is either diffuse it is grouped linear or regional and segmental in distribution okay so what are the associated features you which you may describe in addition to these four findings that we saw that is mass then you saw asymmetry architectural distortion and microcalcifications you may have associated skin thickening or nipple retraction you may have this is the skin thickening then you have uh, you may have uh, you know trabecular thickening in the breast you have may have presence of axillary adenopathy and all this has to be put down in your report now there are certain special things that you can just describe and you do not have to give a descriptive a description as such one of them is an intramammary node so intramammary nodes you can just put down an intramammary node was seen at such and such a position in the breast then presence of skin lesions and solitary dilated duct now after you put down all this you have to make a note as whether this was you know uh, compared with any previous imaging which was available or not 
Now to quickly run through ultrasound biorats because you know they come concomitantly a lot of times when we do a mammogram we have to take the patient to the ultrasound room and screen the patient on ultrasound. We have to remember that the composition is differently labeled. You have either a homogeneous or a heterogeneous appearance on ultrasound with fat or fibroglandular elements being predominantly seen. Now in the cases of masses, besides the you know description of shape and margin, we also give the orientation of the mass. So whether it is oriented parallelly to the breast tissue or anti-parallel, then we have what we can describe as eco-appearances ranging from anechoic to hyperechoic to whether they're hypoechoic, isoechoic or to the heterogeneous lesions. And very importantly, we can also describe the posterior features of the mass, you know, whether there is you know, posterior acoustic enhancement, whether there is just shadowing posterior to the mask or there is no really remarkable feature or there's a combined pattern. So all these can be added in the description of the masses and you come to extra findings that is presence or absence of vascularity, that is the Doppler findings. Then we can also add on the elastography findings, but you have to remember that it really doesn't change the biorats assessment category. It just adds to the radiologist's confidence, right? Now, the most important part is we put all this information together and give a logical conclusion to the patient, right? So this, these are the seven assessment categories of which I personally feel zero, which needs additional imaging, is something that we should not put down on our reports. We should try and do everything possible to call the patient back, complete the imaging, and give one of the rest six uh, possibilities. Now, by that's one, you've done the mammogram, and you found that it's a nice fatty breast. There's nothing in this mammogram that really stares out at you. So you give this as a category, category one or negative, essentially 0% likelihood of cancer. And the patient goes back to routine mammographic screening. So it is obviously given in the screening setting. So let's think about what happens if a patient has come to you with a complaint. Like she says, I have a palpable mass, but you do a mammogram and you actually don't see anything on the mammogram and you really want to give it a Barrett's one. Can you do that? Yes, you may. But at that time, you may have to give an additional recommendation that you need a surgical consult or a surgical reference, or you may need to do a tissue diagnosis of the palpable lump in spite of this being a negative uh, mam mammogram or a Bayrats 1 category mammogram. Now, what is a Bayrats 2 category? A Bayrats 2 category is nothing but a normal assessment with added description of a benign finding. So it is very commonly given in a follow-up case of a breast uh, conservative surgery. In cases of calcified fibroadenomas, when you've seen you know, vascular calcifications or intramarimony lymph nodes in presence of breast implants or fat-containing lesions like lipomas or hematomas, right? Now, this is an example of a patient who has multiple bilateral breast masses, which appear, uh, you know, partly circumscribed really. And when you put the ultrasound on her, you've confirmed that all of them are nothing but cysts. So multiple bilateral breast cysts, if you visualize the breast cysts and see that there is no intracystic solid components, becomes a Bayrats category 2 or benign. There is essentially 0% chance of cancer and the patient goes back to routine mammogram screening. Now, this is another example of a focal asymmetry, which you see in the upper outer quadrant of the left breast. Okay. Now, this focal asymmetry, you take the patient or the ultrasound and confirm that it is nothing. You can use either TOMO or you can use an ultrasound and confirm that this is just nothing but a summation shadow. And this is nothing but, you know, asymmetric prominence of glandular tissue. Again, a benign finding. And this becomes a Bayrats too. Now, you come to this case of a post-operative a patient, you know, who's been operated, then irradiated and has come to you for a follow up. You see this uh, again, an area of focal asymmetry in the breast, which is nothing but an organizing seroma. You see the surgical staples. You do not see any added mass. You know, this is, you know, actually a, just an expected post operative sequelae, and this becomes a Bayrats 2. Now, this is a well circumscribed mass with coarse calcifications within it and it follows all other features of a fibroadenoma it is oval it is wider than taller it is well circumscribed with coarse calcification and this becomes a bi too 
Now, sometimes while giving bairats too, you know, very often uh, I have students who ask me, you know, ma'am, should we describe the intramammary lymph node? Should we describe the skin-based finding? I would say yes, more often than not, put down the finding that you see, whether to describe it or not. If that is the question in your mind, you're better off describing because, you know, eventually if this patient goes off to another radiologist and all, you don't want somebody else confusing skin-based lesion for something within the breast or something like that, right? So it's better to put it down. You can give this in the screening and diagnostic setting. It is also to be given when you have bilateral enlarged reactive appearing axillary lymph nodes, right? And very more often than not, you really don't need to do anything for these bilateral stool lesion except a follow-up. But you can very rarely, you know, recommend management in cases of infected cysts or abscesses. Now, Coming to the BIRATS 5 category, now these are highly suspicious lesions and these three lesions straight away go into this category. Which are they? You have speculated high density masses, then you have irregular or speculated masses with pleomorphic calcifications and you have fine pleomorphic calcifications which are in a linear or segmental distribution straight away by that 5 category right so let's look at the examples you have an irreg uh, you have a speculated increased density mass lesion which appears highly suspicious and greater than 95% chance of cancer now, this is nothing but a large irregular mass lesion with uh, pleomorphic calcifications within it. Again, this becomes a Bayrat's 5 lesion. And here you have these, you know, fine linear branching and pleomorphic calcifications in a, uh, you know, actually this is more than, uh, it's, it's almost like a regional distribution. And this is also a Bayrat's 5 category, right? Uh, you also have to describe the associated features with the, uh, with the mass lesions and you have to put down presence of overlying skin thickening, you may have enlarged abnormal appearing axillary nodes. All these features have to be described in your findings, right? So we finished with Bayrat's category one, which was negative. Bayrat's category two, you saw a finding which was definitely benign. Then we took, looked at the obviously malignant category that was suspicious and Bayrat's five. Now let's come to Bayrat's four. Now, something that appears suspicious to you, where you really want to consider a biopsy, but it is not falling into those prototype three that we described as BIRATS 5, become BIRATS 4. Okay. Now, BIRATS 4 actually has a wide range of probability of breast cancer, and it ranges from 2 to 95%. So, it is further subdivided as 3. Okay. You have three categories in that. You have 4A, 4B, and 4C. Now, 4A we use when there is a low suspicion, almost up to 10%. And this is typically seen with atypical, uh, you know, atypical solid lesions, which are actually fibroadenomas, but they are not calcified, or you have complicated cysts. These become 4A category lesions. Now, you have indistinct masses and amorphous calcifications falling into the 4B category, 10 to 50% of uh, you know, positive predictive value. And you have 4C, that is anything that looks suspicious, but does not fit into the Bayrat's 5 category becomes 4C, and it definitely needs to be biopsy to rule out breast cancer. Now, let's look at this case. You have a focal asymmetry, which is there in the upper outer quadrant of the left breast. The magnification views shows you that this asymmetry hides a small mass lesion. Now you've done the ultrasound, you see that this is an irregular mass lesion with indistinct margins, and it is what we call as taller than wider. It shows a speck of vascularity. It does not fall into the typical three that we described, but yes, this is very, very suspicious. So this becomes a Bayrat's 4C category. Now, again, you have an increased density lesion with indistinct margins. And when you, you put this patient under ultrasound, you see that this is nothing but an irregular lesion with densely packed equals within. And this was nothing but a patient of, you know, an abscess with IgM and you had an enlarged lymph node as well. Now, this becomes a Bayrat's 4A category, right? Then you have, this is a Bayrat 6. It was an already proven case of uh, breast cancer on the opposite side. When she came for a follow-up, you know, there was a uh, grouped amorphous uh, calcifications on, in the opposite breast. And therefore, we this was given a category as 4B. And these were biopsied. And it was, luckily for this patient, it was not malignant, right? 
Now, you come to the category three. I left it specially for the last because I want to go through it, you know, just reiterate a few points. Remember that when you're putting something as category three in your mind as a radiologist or as an imaging person, this lesion has to be benign. All right. It has to be benign, but it is not falling into the prototype benign. Therefore, you are doing something additional and that is you are following it up. Right. So it is greater than zero, but less than two percent chance of malignancy. So in your mind, remember, it has to be a benign lesion. Right. So what is the protocol that you follow with category three lesions? You do a six monthly evaluation and uh, you do this for a two year period. At the end of two years, you either downgrade this lesion to BIRADS2 or if there is a change in between, then you upgrade it to BIRADS4 and biopsy this lesion. So we had Dr. Rupa tell you, you have this solitary group round calcifications is one thing that falls into a category three lesion. Then you have a non-calcified solid mass with, you know, circumscribed margins. That is what we call as a prototype fibroadenoma without the coarse calcification. And you have a focal asymmetry without associated calcifications or distortion, again, falling into the BIRADS3 category. Now, just uh, quickly to run through the uh, ultrasound BIRADS3 as well. Again, you have the circumscribed oval solid mass lesion. Again, your prototype fibroadenoma without the, you know, the coarse calcifications. You can have an isolated complicated cyst or clustered microcyst these may fall into category three then you have areas of fat necrosis these if you are quite certain that it's close it's you know post surgery or something and you're pretty much certain that this is an area of fat necrosis you can follow it up as parads three and uh, you know post-operative breasts now these are the categories that you, you may the distortion which you see in cases of a post surgical scar, this may be put into this category and followed up. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. Now, this is nothing but a fibroadenoma, which looks like a fibroadenoma. You have an oval shaped lesion which is hypoechoic, which is wider than taller. And it does not show calcifications, but margins appear pretty circumscribed. So you are going to call this a BIRADS3 lesion and follow it up. Okay, especially if this is the first time that you have seen uh, this lesion in this patient, right? Next, you have an area of focal asymmetry. Now, this focal asymmetry, you put, you've taken the patient to ultrasound and you've seen that this is asymmetric prominent glandular tissue and there is no associated mass. In this patient, there was an area of you know, a few small cysts in this region, this goes into category three. Now, this is a, a fairly circumscribed increased density lesion in the left retroareolar region, which you put the ultrasound and see that this is nothing but a complicated cyst. So this becomes a BIRADS3, okay? Now, the category six is nothing but you've imaged the patient you know, you've done a biopsy, you know that it's proven cancer, but you've imaged the patient again before the final definitive surgery has occurred. So this can be because you've done a second opinion on this patient, or you've done a monitoring post NACT, or you've re-looked at the patient, you know, after the surgery with positive margins. So any of these cases, you will give category six. Now, this is an example of a patient who was, you know, uh, clipped. Uh, prior to any CT, and now she's followed up. The mass is completely gone, so we hook wired this lesion for the uh, surgeon to excise, and this becomes a BIRADS category six lesion, right? So I just want to reiterate that you have to make sure that your report and your findings gives a clear and concise message to your clinician. We saw BIRADS five lesions, the three prototype lesions. You have to remember that tissue diagnosis is mandatory. Though those lesions which are speculated mass lesions, which are not the irregular mass lesions with pleomorphic calcifications or fine linear microcalcifications, but are suspicious become BIRADS4 and these also need to be biopsied. BIRADS1 we saw negative. We usually give it in the screening setting. Very rarely you can give it in the diagnostic setting, but you need to add this addendum, right? BIRADS2 Bilateral multiple well circumscribed lesions are given these categories, especially you have bilateral multiple fibroadenomas, bilateral multiple cysts. Uh, you may describe the largest or the clinically palpable lesions in this breast. 
And by rights three, again, let me reiterate that this has to be given when you have a benign diagnosis in your mind and not when you don't know the diagnosis. Uh, just to end, this is an example of a patient who has a solitary dilated duct. In this patient, she also has a skin-based lesion. So let's see what biorides would you assign to this imaging. I would be happy giving it a biorides 4 because I was not able to demonstrate vascularity anywhere. But you have to remember that a solitary dilated ductal system with or without vascularity goes into the biorides 4 category, right? When you have a lesion in the breast with multiple findings, like you've had, you have a lesion with a margin which is partly circumscribed or speculated, you remember that the speculation will trump the circumscribed margin. So worst imaging feature of the lesion will decide your final uh, conclusion in your mind. In multiple masses, which we saw, like if you have a large palpable cyst and three, four speculated margins, it is the worst lesion category that is going to trump the other lesions, right? So it is going to be the worst category that is going to be assigned. Follow the correct sequence, right? Follow the mammogram first and then the ultrasound. So there's no chance of missing things like architectural distortion. Remember, in certain cases, we can directly say that this is an intramammary node, this is a lipoma, this is a hematoma. We really don't need to do anything further. Axilla always assessed with the breast. We mentioned that when you have bilateral axillary nodes which appear reactive, it becomes a parrots too. At the same time, enlarged nodes in one axilla becomes a parrots four, right? And we really don't end here. We have to do a radiopath concordance and that is really absolutely mandatory. So I think I will end here and thank you all for a very patient hearing. <music>